test. Ouais. Test.
Hallo. Oké, okay, guys. Welcome everyone. Can you all please take a seat so we can start with the lecture? Oké, okay. so today uh, Powerhouse will tell something about the Bunker Toren. Uh, you all probably know the building on the, across the street. Uh, so yeah, they will tell us something about reviving this uh, icon. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Electric. <laughs> now, uh, good. Good afternoon. Is this? Can everybody hear me? More or less. Okay, my name's Megan Kerr. This is Dan Masmeyer. We both worked on the bunker quite extensively over the last five years. Um, I just apologize in advance. I have a bit of a sore throat, so let's see if my voice makes it through the rest of the presentation. Um, let's get started. Is everybody seated? I'll get going. Well, we are Powerhouse. We are an office of about 50 people at the moment. Uh, we are quite international. Uh, we have offices kind of all, well, all over. We have an office uh, in Rotterdam, we have an office in Oslo, in Munich. Uh, we were once upon a time in China, and we have just set up an office in Nairobi. Uh, we have quite an extensive portfolio of projects, starting with Villa One, which is a private uh, client. Uh, it was really the test case to see what Powerhouse could do in terms of pushing engineering and also pushing design, and living within a really minimal, uh, yeah, within a minimal design. We do things from yeah, uh, huge villas in uh, Munich. This is about two and a half thousand square meters. Uh, we do things like um, train stations. This is an enormous canopy which spans over the train tracks at uh, Station, Station Assen. And it is all in timber construction with uh, steel connections. We also do offices like the headquarters in Hofdorp of ASICS, uh, Lawyers and Loof, which is a lawyer's uh, firm that's also uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, Tilburg, we just completed this building. It is all CLT with a natural stone uh, cladding. It has a little bit of a wink to the bunker tower as well. Uh, we also are in the middle of constructing a complete um, CLT affordable housing uh, complex in Pendrecht. This is our first tower, uh, which we did in uh, Amsterdam, called the Amstelthorer. Ooh, too far. Oh, just getting used to the controls. We are busy constructing Cayo Plain. This is a multi-residential uh, complex, which is also going to be the new gateway to the central station there. We are in the middle of a Omgevingsvergunning, a building uh, application process for the environmental permit. And this is a huge development, which Dan is busy with, <laughs> or part of. We also d built in China. Uh, this is a, a huge uh, display uh, complex, which is also a sporting facility with a continuous loop, which you can run around and or walk around as you please. And then a similar, uh, let's say, shape, but has completely different function. This is the Kanakala Tower in Turkey. It's a radio antenna. And we also design objects, the Kokiya chair. This is also one of our more recent buildings. We also happen to work in this building. It's a floating, floating office in the Rheinhaver in Rotterdam, where yeah, we are ba basically on the water. We can open up all of our doors. We have lovely meeting rooms. We eat outside. We have plants everywhere. We also have a rhino on the deck, which is now not red. He's bronze. Um, and then we also have this sort of style staircase as well, and where we have our meetings. And then we have like a, a large open office plan where the majority of us, yeah, come to the office every day. So on to another most recently uh, completed building. Is this my turn? Yes. No, it's your turn. Thanks, Megan. Uh, today we want to talk about reviving an icon. We want to talk about the bunker tower, which is uh, across the street. Uh, and today we want to focus mainly on the, the process from design to delivery. Uh, something you don't learn in school, but you just have to learn from experience like uh, like we did for the last five years. Uh, and to start up with, I want to show a quick video by Nana de Rue. He's a founding partner uh, of Powerhouse. And he's talking a bit about uh, the bunker and introducing it, actually. The bunker is a sort of legendary place in, uh, in Eindhoven. Enerzijds stond vooral bekend om de activiteiten die, die zich daar ontplooiden. Uh, en anderzijds stond het ook al bekend als een gebouw. 
In oorsprong was het bedoeld als een soort uh, multifunctioneel centrum voor uh, de universiteit. En in de loop der tijd is dat gebouw eigenlijk ontwikkeld tot een uh, ja, tot soort culturele, culturele hotspot. En in zekere zin een verbindende schakel eigenlijk tussen de TU en de stad. Ik kan me ook herinneren, toen ik, uh, toen ik nog studeerde, ging ik ook wel eens met, uh, met vrienden in Eindhoven uit. Maar dat eindigde ook vaak in de bunker. Dat was een beetje zo'n kansloos moment op de avond dat je eigenlijk al uh, veel te veel had gedronken voordat je dan alsnog even naar de bunker ging. Itself, the existing building is a typical uh, expression of uh, brutalism. Uh, it was designed in the 70s by uh, Hugh Maaskant, as you might know. Uh, the bunker itself, it's not a typical bunker that we will use in, the, in the, the Second World War or so. It is mostly like a nickname for the building because it's so massive, monolithical, concrete building with the slanted walls uh, and all. And it was basically designed for the student associations uh, here at the TU uh, campus. Uh, to house them, uh, but also to function as a connecting element between the city and the students of the, the campus here. And uh, when we actually in 2000, I believe 17, uh, visited the site, it was already vacant and not being used anymore. And it was kind of a apocalyptical yeah, environment there, derelict. Uh, you could still see the signs, for example, the SRE on the, on the left side, uh, that it was used before. Um, also indoors, you could still really uh, smell all the, the alcohol and all the, the beers that would be poured on the, on the floor. It was also still quite sticky there. Um, but it was very nice to experience still that feeling of what, what happened there before. And it was also the starting point of our design uh, process, actually. Um, and then when we came back, we really looked at the, the building itself, like what does it now really represent? Of course, the horizontality in it is quite obvious, uh, and uh, the monolithical yeah, expression. But when you closer look into the details, you could also find like in the materials that they used uh, the, the molds in there for the concrete. Also, the, the direction and the orientation that uh, Maaskant used is quite a detailed second layer if you look closer to it. Uh, then to fully... Uh, yeah, See what is now very important to the building. Uh, we also collaborated with Steenhuis Murs. Uh, they made an entire uh, booklet and an archive study about like what does the building represent and what is still in there. What should we really keep and uh, embrace, and what could uh, eventually also be demolished and be yeah, taken to uh, to a next step. So for ourselves, we also made this kind of a uh, toolbox. It also really functioned in the end uh, to the. Uh, demolition crew and also the contractor to really show like uh, with this part you can do this with this you can't really touch and uh, you should be left alone uh, in the end we also used even these kind of uh, point clouds to really focus and and have a grip on what is now the existing and then if we go to the design uh, our design is really about uh, our approach of keeping the existing so the, the bunker itself is kind of a u-shaped uh, still there, and then the new massing, the new volume that we need to have in there because of the business case is now placed as a, as a tower in the center of the building. And it was really the part which was very dark and, and, and uh, yeah, quite unusable. So it was a kind of a win-win. And in our approach, uh, we really want to blend the existing uh, with the new. Uh, that we kept really on until the detailing, until like the very uh, delivery of the building. We tried to strive really for that. And not only like in the volume and the massing, we try to uh, to put the existing into the new, but also we use the horizontality in the tower, but also uh, yeah, kind of a gradient in transparency. So you could also see in this uh, visual that we made uh, quite at the beginning, that you really see this uh, gradient of, of transparency uh, towards the top. And then in the top, it really connects to the 
actually the skyline of, of Eindhoven and really becomes this modern tower where it starts from the existing and rises up. You could also see it in these visuals, like mainly the, the materials that we would use. Uh, so to, re to reflect the, the concrete of the existing, we also used uh, natural stone and then a bit more white and grayish kind of tone, but also uh, a second layer uh, behind that with all the glass and the wooden panels, which also comes back into the existing. And this is then a site from the Kennedy Lan. And then the engineering part of it. De uitdaging die we hadden in het ontwerpen van de bunkertoren was eigenlijk van hoe voegen we iets toe aan de bestaande bunker. Het geval hier was dat die uitbreiding veel groter was dan de bestaande bunker. En wat we eigenlijk hebben geprobeerd is uh, in die voormetaal en het ontwerp van die toren uh, juist aansluiting te zoeken bij de voormetaal van de bestaande bunker. In het ontwerp hebben we eigenlijk de bestaande bunker uh, vereenvoudigd tot een aantal hoofdvormen. Dus ook de schuine lijnen die je ziet in die gevel. En die hebben we ook terug laten komen in de toren. Daarnaast hebben we in materiaalgebruik en in kleur en in open dicht van die gevel hebben we ook die uh, referentie weer gezocht naar de bestaande bunker. Materiaal is een, uh, een wit-grijze natuursteen. En die hebben we eigenlijk gekozen omdat we in de materialisering van de bunker waren we eigenlijk op zoek naar een, uh, een materiaal wat een, een link had, wat een referentie had naar het, het bestaande materiaal van de, van de bunker. Uh, het is natuurlijk een heel erg betonnen gebouw. En het beton wordt gemaakt met bekistingen. En wat je heel erg ziet in de gevel van de bunker is dat die bekistingen een bepaald patroon heeft. Zowel verticaal als horizontaal. En eigenlijk met deze natuursteen hebben we sowieso qua kleur, dus de wit-grijze kleur, als referentie naar het grijze beton. Maar ook het patroon, dus de lijnen die, die op natuurlijke wijze in dat natuursteen zit, is eigenlijk ook een verwijzing naar het lijnenspel wat in de gevel van de bunker zit. all of these wonderful videos, looking back at it, you actually have to engineer it, and that's what we're going to talk about now. <laughs> so we have five topics we'll talk about. It's about the choice of the materials, how we also selected the natural stone, uh, the process of the wooden cladding, and prefabrication of the window frames, and then the Keimlach. And for the English speakers, that's just a transparent layer which protects the, you know, the cleaned uh, concrete, which we will get to. So in the material selection, um, of course, we have this palette of a, you know, the bunker itself has the timber formwork concrete, and that was really this, the starting point of all of the material selection from there. That's the main, con the main material. Then from there, you have that second layer, which is all of the raw anodized aluminium window frames, so on the left-hand side here. And then you see... Well, at the time, it was a really derelict, but there's a lot of wooden planks as the second layer as well. So if it wasn't concrete, it would then be a cladded uh, wooden facade. So from that, we, of course, had to renovate that, bring it back as close to the original as possible, but then also choose a complementary pallet, which was going to uh, then fit the tower. So like Stein, who was uh, a found, he's one of the original partners at Powerhouse, but he's not with us anymore, he's moved on. Um, he was explaining about how we chose this uh, natural stone to complement the concrete, but not to be too overbearing, but still have its own character. And then we picked a, you know, a, what we called resistor at the time. It was a composite uh, wood. And then we were playing with the different uh, colors of anodized al aluminium, not to do the raw aluminium, which was in the original bunker, but to give it a new level and then go with something with a, uh, a color to it. So. Early in the design phase, um, 
we had regular contact with the municipality, you cannot imagine how many meetings we had with them because it was going to be a monument as well. So we had to test every single material that we chose. And so in the early phase, before there was even a contractor contracted to the building, we had them make a mock-up for us um, to test, okay, we here we have a window frame, which is al aluminium, we have the resistor in a panel, and then we have these bands, these big natural stone bands, which Dan explained in the gradient. They go from a very big one and a half metre band to one metre up to half a metre, so that, that we could use that transition to play with that gradient in the design. So it came down to the... It came down to the... Uh, yep, hello. <laughs> came down to uh, little details like, okay, what happens between these um, panels? Is it going to be waterproof out of the waterproofing, the natural stone, or is it going to be a waterproofing layer behind it? So, of course, it was waterproof behind or it is waterproof behind the natural stone. But, you know, how do you want to uh, read this building? If you don't put seams between the each plate, then it doesn't have the same massiveness that the current, but like the existing bunker had. So... In the end, I think it came down to about seven kilometres of silicon kit between the uh, the natural stone that has to be applied to the building. Uh, and then it was down to the colour of it. Is it dark? Is it light? All of these details were conversations that we had on a regular basis. It was a lot of fun. So this was a mock-up that was made um, before there was even a contractor on site. Nothing was demolished. We just placed it there on site. And then you could have like these really good discussions about, okay, this is the reality of it. Um, and then you get some scale to what is going to come in the future. Uh, the natural stone, selecting it. Just because you choose a natural stone, that doesn't mean that that's the end of it. You have to be really sharp and have a lot of contact with your supplier and also the contractor, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are putting this all together. So what we did, uh, we, we chose this, um, the what is it called? Morona car Caramello. And as you can imagine, just by the, s the name, it has like some warm sort of tones to it. So we had to be very clear uh, in our selection. So we went to Haricola. It's a, a Eindhoven uh, stone supplier. And they made these samples of 60 by 40 centimetres and they laid them all out in front of us and we just got to do this overview where we could then say, okay, this is an acceptable grey tone this is an unacceptable grey tone, and this is, uh, so we made a mock-up on the right-hand side, we made a mock-up on the on what the size would really be with a couple of panels together, and then on the left we said, okay, these are good, but um, these are not so good because there were bald spots in them, and in, if you're looking at a facade that's supposed to be complementary, you want that to be as massive in appearance as possible. And then the other thing that we had mocked up, if you see on the right-hand side, the direction of the grain or the striation in the natural stone, it was good if it was vertical as it went around the edges, but on the right, you can see that it goes from being horizontal, sorry, vertical on the f face front, but on the sides, they turned, um, turned to be horizontal. So that for us wasn't acceptable. So once you set these guidelines out, then the contractor knows exactly what they're working with. Um, and that makes a difference in the calculation because you have these leftover pieces when you cut a big slab of natural stone. And so what do you do with them to be as efficient and as sustainable as possible with a product like this? You have to be able to reuse as much of it as possible because it's not cheap. Um, just to explain a little bit here, uh, the right-hand slide is, sorry, the left-hand slide is the balconies, which are, you see here in the video, they're being suspended up onto the up onto that front facade. So they lifted these pieces up one piece at a time. And sometime, in some cases, we, you were talking about five or six pieces that had to be connected together. And then you see these kind of teeth here on the left, and they had to be individually placed in also with a crane. So it was quite, it's kind of tough work, but in the end, it's a really nice clean band. Uh, so it's like the contractor did a really exceptional job here. And then in the base, this was the last piece to be placed because this was a Hautskelet bow, like a wooden framing structure instead of a um, facade element, which Dan will talk about just in a moment. The base, this was all placed um, by scaffolding. And so in this case, we had to then create this very massive foot where the tower could land. 
Um, and the only difference here, all of our um, material was in horizontal striations in the natural stone, but you can just see these small slits where we decided to just play with it a little bit differently in the foot, and you can see some um, vertical um, bands as well. Down. The wooden cladding, yeah. We had uh, these talks, like uh, Megan referred to, with the municipality, with the beauty committee, and um, in the... Um, in the design that we made, we want to refer to the bunker, and part of it is referring to the, the wooden planks, which are we can be found in existing uh, building. Um, and together with the municipality, we decided to put uh, resista as a cladding on the facade, uh, in which we could also have the same tones as the, the wooden planks that you would nor normally use, but in a more sustainable way. Because resista is kind of a composite, it's an extrusion. Um, and in this case, we could make even the planks as we, we want to have with, uh, with wood. Um, but when we, we went along, we had this kind of a hiccup, which you always need in a process, of course. Um, we ran into the, the fire regulations because it's a tower and you don't want it to catch fire and act as like a chimney. Um, so in this case, uh, we needed to find an alternative. And with the supplier, we had this uh, other pro profile as well, which they could make. Uh, it wasn't an open structure as the planks before, but a closed off part. Um, in this case, we, we, yeah, we had a, a fire certificate, but what you could also see on the picture uh, bottom right is that these profiles tend to bend quite a lot. So the uh, downside of it was that we need to have a lot of screws in there. Uh, so all in all, we went into this process uh, together with the contractor as well, and they also need to have uh, comfort with what they built. Um, so in the end, we went to our uh, fallback plan, actually, uh, is using just uh, wooden planks, uh, but in this case, plateau wood. And what they do is that they uh, already, uh, from the beginning, they can already preheat the, the elements and also coat them in a way uh, that you don't have to paint them uh, every year. And they also come already in this kind of gray tone, so you don't have the effect of uh, UV uh, lighting on it and having different colors uh, in your uh, uh, building. Uh, and in the end, we were quite happy that we, in the end, went for uh, plateau wood and not for the for the resista because we really think it's a, it's a nice, warm tone that they have uh, and, and well executed as well. Um, then on to the prefabrication of the window frames, and basically, it's more than just a window frame um, because the, the left side you see our design uh, zoomed in, and what you basically can see is that there's a lot of repetition in it, and the fact it's a tower. So you don't want to put up, like in a traditional way, a scaffolding around the building and then just start uh, putting in the different layers uh, of the facade. Um, in this case, we went for prefabrication because it was the smartest way to do it and also the uh, most cost-effective. Cost um, and also what you can see on the right is this kind of repetition of different elements. And in the end, we, uh, we had this kind of uh, a team uh, consisting out of uh, subcontractors. Uh, with their own specialty, so there was one of the, the window frames, there was one subcontractor for uh, mounting the natural stone uh, in front of it. Uh, there was the supplier of natural stone, so together with all these expert, experts and plata wood, um, we created this kind of element, which you would also see on site in just the photo that, uh, that Megan showed. Uh, and in this part, we could really yeah, engineer the entire facade uh, for, the, for the tower, and we could already prefab prefabricated in such a way that they could just slide it onto the building, uh, as say. Um, yeah, we went to a lot of uh, workshops as well, uh, just to, to have a visual experience of what we're gonna make. Um, and also, as, as Megan would refer to as the, the soldiers lined up, which you could see in the, in the middle image. It's really nice to see in the end how they um, made all these elements uh, also on site. And beforehand, already the natural stone would be uh, placed uh, on those elements. So it was really already a clean, fixed element for the facade. And I don't remember how long they took for, uh, for a complete story, but in quite a fast pace, you could already see the tower grow, actually, or per week. Yeah. So it was really nice to, to see like what you engineered uh, in the end, also in the result. <laughs> Hmm. 
And then probably one of our favorite topics is the cain, uh, which is, like I said before, this transparent coating, uh, which apparently you can also put colors into. So part of the discussions with the municipality, this had an effect on the, uh, let's say, the monumental status of the original bunker. So they had a lot to say about the process of choosing colors and how transparent it was going to be. So I think this was November 2020, middle of Corona. It was a great site visit. We had to choose uh, the tone of um, yeah the tone of the paint itself. From here, the contractor took a slice of concrete, put it on the ground, and literally just painted it down. And it's for us, it was also clear that this was basically like painting the concrete, and the actual character of the concrete wasn't coming through. So, municipality and we agreed this is of course not what we want. So we came back in June, uh, a few yeah a few months later. And the contractor then, I think in the end, they spent something around 5,000 euros just on samples of paint and different transparencies of it. So if you go over to the cafe at some point, there is a terrace there. And on that terrace, we experimented for months painting. I think in the end, we tried three different colors. We tried three different transparencies, so 25%, 50%, 75%. And then together with the municipality, uh, we came along had our natural stone sample, had the cleaned uh, uh, concrete. And then you can see on the left image, we're there with the municipality, actually with paint samples, choosing the, the right um, the right colour. So I think in the end it took us mm, 10 months to get to a paint choice, but we got there because in the end, you see the left-hand side is cleaned and caimed, and the right-hand side hasn't been caimed yet, but it has been cleaned. So what it did was just basically lift yeah, the tone of that whole concrete over, the, over the, uh, the existing. So if you see the, let's say, the dirty or the untreated, you can see the, there's a much better relationship between the natural stone on, on the right with the kaim on the left. And if we'd left it yellow, it just would have had this yeah, very 70s appeal. And the whole idea was to revive the icon of the bunker. So... When we were on site, we, of course, also got to be in some da slightly dangerous situations. We got to go on the... Well, I got to go. Darn wouldn't do it. <laughs> we got to go in the window cleaning buck, and there was a reason to do this. Uh, we had to check what the contractor was actually delivering. So in this, we're ha hanging 100 metres in the sky. I'm there in the buck with the, the contractor. And then what we're actually looking for are things like how well are the plates actually joining together on the bottom and top? Are we missing screws on the left-hand side here? Are there scratches on the natural stone that we don't want to have? All these really minor details, which in the overall make a difference. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of the view I had very... Yeah, I think that's enough of that video. Let's just play it one more time. Because it also... The thing is, all of these natural stone pieces were cut on site... And there's a lot of dust involved as well. So as it rains, this building will eventually clean itself. But there's still dust coming out from underneath the, the plates. Um, so you can see that on the glass there, which was quite interesting. But yeah, we were still missing pieces of plateau wood because the connection wasn't there yet. Um, that part was mounted on that particular facade element. So there were pieces that had to come from at different stages. And, you know, it's a huge building. It needed a lot of uh, checking. So... Um, in the end, okay, what did we deliver? Uh, we're really proud of what we did. Um, we we have 210 new apartments in Eindhoven Centre. It's not too far away from the original uh, render. And uh, we took some photos at, before the uh, landscape got put in last year, but I think in the end, the appearance is how we... It was a pretty good process, even though we went through three years of corona in the in the middle of that as well. So we have a couple of um, visualizations, and then how does that look in comparison to yeah what we actually created? That was this guy versus this. Um, it's not bad. We we're pretty proud of it. And uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> you can clap if you want to. <laughs> 
any, yeah. Would I change anything? Well, <clears throat> I would change, originally we had a, a tower designed of 120 meters. So if you see the building from this side of the campus, you see that it's, she's a bit wide. Um, what we had to do during, I think it was 2018, 2019, the municipality didn't agree with bringing it to 120 metres, so we had to bring it back down to 100 metres cap. So all of that program in the business case had to go somewhere else. So it got a full grid line extra to the south. No, north. I'm Australian. My north-south is a bit off. Always. <laughs> and we had to put that program somewhere else. So in the end, I would have preferred that the tower was more slender and tall but, you know, at the end of the day, you also still need to build things and you have to just take it and run with it and still do the best with what you have uh, being given. Because if you can a project based just on that one fact, then, yeah, then you're not a great architect, I think. Yeah. Has to be another question. We... I will answer. You can, you can do the next one. We didn't want to fight with the original bunker. I think that's the... At the end of the day, we, we did consider whether we would do a prefab, like something a little bit more like this. But in the end, it would not have had the same... Like, we wanted to keep the core of the bunker the way that it was and keep it brutalist, but then not copy it, but do something which was complementary. I think you can copy, of course, but, yeah, I also think that this outcome was quite beautiful as well. We also really like natural stone at Powerhouse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is kind of a bad example, but I also like the number of trees in the middle. So yeah. Is this a bad one? Yeah. yeah. And we also considered aluminium at some point, but <laughs> we didn't go there, obviously. One more question? No. Well, thank you very much for your time. I think we are on time, right? Right on? Very good. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's a wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, you can all uh, go upstairs to scan your student card uh, for the My Future points. And don't forget to take a look at the chair of the future that's uh, upstairs. There are some people from the Go Green office. They can tell you all about it. Um, so yeah, it's there for the whole week. Thank you.